Tonight's speaker is Don Dollar. Don is actively involved in a number of organizations, including this museum. He was an educator for 41 years. He was the assistant principal of the year for Massachusetts. He won the award for Outstanding Teacher of American History in the United States. And he also has received the George Washington Medal for Excellence in Education, which was presented to him by the Freedom Foundation. We're very pleased and very proud to have John speak to us tonight. John? Thank you very much. Uh, for those who've heard me before, you know exactly what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> My father taught me something. He said that the mind can absorb only what the seat can endure. <laughs> and when he went to church, if the minister spoke too long, he tapped his watch. <laughs> and the longer the minister went, the higher the watch went. In 41 years of teaching, I had told my students this, and I watched to see how soon they went like this. I'm watching you people tonight. Well, welcome. Um, I uh, want to tell you we, we began a five-year anniversary of the Civil War. Can't call it a celebration, because that epic event brought the death of over 600,000 Americans. If I took all the losses for World War I and World War II, they would not be equal to the American Civil War. I have some special ties to the Civil War. No, I was not alive at the time <laughs> the Civil War took place. But the last surviving Civil War veteran in the town of Marblehead was born, uh, was, died in 1944, the year I was born. Name was Sam Snow. Anybody here related to Sam Snow? Thank you for coming. Um, and it, it's interesting because that was our last physical contact with the Civil War. I want to tell you another 50 years, and the Civil War will be looked at as we look at the American Revolution. However, it is a tragic event, and yet it impacted on this town probably as great as the American Revolution. So what I want to do is take you through the, those beginning days of the Civil War. Why is it so significant? Because tomorrow morning, Marblehead got yanked into the Civil War as quickly as the American people did on December 7, 1941. Now I want to tell you, no Marbleheader in 1860 question whether the Civil War was coming. They knew it was going to happen. The only question was when. And I'm surprised that April 15th, 1861, there were enough Marbleheaders still in town because the fishing trade could have taken them out to the Grand Banks for the spring. But they knew that something was going to take place. And, it, and I'll, I'll just prove it to you. The date is November 6th, 1860. One week before, the Republicans had marched through the town of Marblehead in a torchlight parade. Over 400 wide awakers paraded with torches. Wide Awake was a special club uh, founded by the Republicans to get young people involved. On the and that was on a Thursday night before the election. On Friday night, the Constitutional Union Party decided they were going to march through. However, there had been a train accident out by Legs Hill. Therefore, the road was, the, uh, the tracks were blocked, and so a number of people could not come in. However, they turned out 107 people carrying torches. Town of Marblehead was actively involved in this election. The next morning, November 7th, they went to the polls. Out of 1,400 voters, 1,302 voters cast ballots. Now keep in mind, in those days, we actually covered a section of Salem called Ward 5. So when I say Marblehead voted, 
There's a small section of Salem people who may have helped out. Lincoln won this town by 654 votes. The closest uh, number of votes that followed after was the Democratic Party, about 300 votes, and then smaller parties. And the last one that came in was the Constitutional Union Party, um, and the candidate was Benjamin Butler running for governor. His name will be significant as we go through 1861. Marblehead supported Abraham Lincoln. Now, if you've read the Marblehead magazine, you're going to see that some historians will tell you the war came because of slavery. I'm going to tell you this, the war did not become the major issue. The war for Marbleheaders was an issue of constitution, it was an issue of country. And I'm going to tell you, most Marbleheaders would go back and say, our families fought in the revolution to, pr to produce a government. We're not going to separate that government. So the election results are in. Now keep in mind, Marblehead had a newspaper called the Marblehead Ledger. And I'm able to go back and read sections on that ledger. Like any good Marblehead paper, it didn't get printed every week. And obviously, a lot of the copies didn't get saved. So I'm able to look just at a few pieces of this. But on November 7th, the town crier walked through this town with news that probably shook most Marbleheaders. On November 7th, the state of South Carolina raised its own state flag and seized every federal fort, every mint, every bank in the state. In fact, one U.S. Army officer is sent to the arsenal to get weapons to supply the few remaining forts. South Carolina arrested that U.S. Army officer. The president is Buchanan. Lincoln is waiting to be inaugurated. It's going to be March before he's inaugurated. Buchanan is the lame duck president. He does nothing. He waits. By November 13th, South Carolina calls for 10,000 volunteers to form an army for the independent state of South Carolina. They also call for a convention. Five days later, Georgia does the same thing. Seven days later, Mississippi, and then Louisiana, then Alabama, and then Florida, and then Texas, and then uh, Arkansas. It isn't until after tomorrow do we find Virginia and Tennessee and North Carolina joining the group. On December 20th, South Carolina sends delegates to Buchanan to negotiate a peaceful settlement between the state of South Carolina and the government. December 26th, the federal officer in Charleston, South Carolina, has to make a decision. He says, I cannot protect the few remaining forts I have. So he decides to evacuate all federal troops that still remain loyal to Fort Sumter. It is a fort located in the center of the harbor. I'm not sure he made the right decision. He evacuates to a fort that has been built to defend Charleston. Therefore, all the guns are facing out to sea. It isn't even finished. He brings all the federal troops into that fort. December 26th, he's waiting, and he's waiting. January 6th, South Carolina demands that he surrender the property of South Carolina to the governor. Anderson, Major Anderson, refuses. Buchanan does the one thing that he probably should have done earlier. There's a ship called the Star of the West. He loads it with food and basic supplies, no ammunition. And he sends it to relieve Anderson. The ship appears on the scene, and South Carolina forts open fire on the Star of the West. 
and she returned to New York. Buchanan does nothing else after that. Lincoln is saying to Buchanan, take a quick step. By now, federal arsenals and forts are being seized in all of those southern states. It's not until February 18th the Confederacy is formed. Now you have a clear government that stands in opposition to this Union government. March 12th, that Confederacy sent three delegates. Mind you, Marbleheaders are listening every day to something's happening. So they sent delegates on March 12th to talk to the government. Lincoln. Lincoln won't even speak to them. He said, you will meet with my Secretary of War, Stanton. And they meet with him, and Stanton says, you've met with me, goodbye. He refuses to negotiate. Every state is preparing for war. The only question is, when is it going to happen? On April 14th, now you should know this because the newspapers have started talking today, or a couple of days ago. On the 14th of April, South Carolina opened fire on Fort Sumter. For two days, they bombarded that fort. They basically couldn't fire back. He kept waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, on April 14th, Major Anderson, he doesn't surrender the fort, he evacuates it. He simply lowers the flag, and under a flag of truce, he is on a vessel, and he takes the men, and he leaves Charleston, South Carolina. Abraham Lincoln has no choice. And so Abraham Lincoln issues this statement. I have to read it because it will explain the reason for the Civil War. Whereas the laws of the United States have been for some time past and now, that's a little zing it, President Buchanan, up, um, are opposed and the execution thereof obstructed in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas by a combination too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial process or by the powers vested in the marshals by the law. Now, therefore I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, in virtue of the power vested in me by the Constitution and the laws, have thought it fit to call forth the militia of the several states of the Union to the aggrievous and I, I have trouble with the next word here, number 75,000 in order to suppress the combinations and to cause the laws to be duly executed. Abraham Lincoln is saying it is simply a case of constitutional violation. Why doesn't he use the U.S. Army? They're on the West protecting against the Native uh, against the Native Americans. He doesn't dare pull them. In fact, in Texas, the general in charge of the U.S. Army has deserted and has turned over the entire army to the Confederacy. And by the way, that would be the last location the Confederate Army surrenders in. So he has to call on the state militias. He sends this proclamation to every state of the Union, South Carolina, all the governors saying, I want you to supply your state militia to put down this. And he doesn't use the word yet, but ultimately he will call it a rebellion. He will not negotiate with the Confederacy because if he does, he gives them due recognition. He can't call it a war because if it is, it's against a foreign power. So he is going to constantly refer to this as a rebellion. Marbleheaders are now going to be called into action. Well, Marblehead has a militia. They've had a militia since 1805. The one problem in 1861 is that most of the weapons they're carrying are 
just been issued in 1812. The militia is dressed in something you would never recognize as a Civil War uniform. In fact, the, the company from Salem wear the beaver hats that you would see a British officer wearing. What do we see? 1855, state of Massachusetts had established two regiments, the 6th Regiment and the 8th Regiment. The 8th Regiment has eight companies. Now keep this in mind, it's all in this area. Three of them are from the town of Marblehead. Company B, Company C, and Company H. Lynn has two companies, Gloucester 1, Beverly 1, Newburyport 1, and Gloucester 1. Eight companies. April 15th, Lincoln's proclamation is issued. A telegram is sent by a U.S. senator named Wilson to the governor of Massachusetts. I want 20 companies to be in Washington, D.C. as quickly as possible. Why? Where's Washington located? It's right at the, just below the Mason-Dixon line. It's being sealed off. Okay. The lieutenant colonel of the regiment, the 8th Regiment, that covers this area, sends off telegrams to uh, Lynn, to Newburyport, to Gloucester, and he personally goes to Beverly first. I know why. Then he came to Marblehead. And the story, and I love this story, he goes to the captain of one of the companies, Not V. Martin. Are there any descendants of Not Martin here? There's a saying about Martins. You can tell a Martin something, but you can't tell a Martin something. <laughs> well, and Dollarburg can say that. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Hicks comes into Marblehead and he finds Not Martin in his slaughterhouse. He's just cut the throat of a pig. He's covered with blood. He's getting ready to scald the pig. Hicks says, tomorrow morning, I want your company armed and on Boston Common. Martin is supposed to have looked at his coat, pulled up his sleeves, bloody sleeves, and said, damn the hog. And he goes out the door to inform his company. Marblehead, on April 15th, is now in the American Civil War. The next morning, Company C, Company B, and Company H is formed up. It's sleeting, it's snowing. They march through the town of Marblehead, and most of the town has turned out, and they're cheering them. One man even yells at them, he called for 75,000, he should have called for 300,000 and crushed the South. They parade down by the old townhouse, and if you remember J.L.J. Frost's picture of them marching, they must have been pretty good. They were almost as big as the townhouse. And they marched to the depot, and where, where's the de uh, depot? The railroad depot, depot. Well, right where the National Grand is. And there they meet my great-great-grandfather, who's the conductor of the trains, John C. Harris. They are there at 7 o'clock in the morning, armed and ready to fight the South. Harris loads on Company C, not Martin, and I'm sure Martin made sure it was Company C that got on first. And the company <coughs> um, uh, H, which is Francis Boardman uh, Company. Now his family actually ran a bakery shop down by the townhouse, Boardman's Bakery. So we have Boardman with, and they say 40 muskets. Now mind you, these muskets are probably Mexican War. 1848, 34 muskets, 40 men. They're into the cars on the 
train in 1861. They go directly to Boston, Massachusetts. Harrison loads them. It has to be about 8.30 in the morning. The Eastern Railroad, that's pre-broken and mangled Boston, Maine, the crowds are there. So Martin and Boardman line up. Martin first and then Boardman. And they march from the railroad station, not to the common because it's snowing. There's one officer who said, you will go to Faneuil Hall. They march to two companies through Boston, people cheering, being played Yankee Doodle. Harris scoots back to Marblehead and picks up the next company, which he loads on at 9 o'clock and gets them to Boston by 11. Don't let anyone tell you different. We have eyewitness accountants sworn statement. The very first regiment to respond is the 8th Regiment. But the first company to respond is Company C and Company H from the town of Marblehead. So when you sing that song, first in Revolution and first in 61, there is a historic uh, record to prove that's the case. The only problem is Martin, at the head of that uh, company, gets to Faneuil Hall, and it's locked tight. <laughs> he takes his sword with the hilt, and he bangs on the door until they open it up. He marches his company in first. Then comes Boardman. By that stage, Lynn has got a company there. Boston has got a company there. Must have been embarrassing for Boston. <laughs> to be beat out by having a, a regiment by 9 o'clock to get to Faneuil Hall. Who knows, maybe they were standing on the common and didn't get the word, but makes no difference. We can say we are the first ones. From that point on, the 8th Regiment is ordered to proceed to Washington, D.C. And the general has been appointed by the governor, John Andrew. The general is Benjamin Butler, the failed gubernatorial candidate who had lost to Andrew. Benjamin Butler will be in charge of the 8th and 6th Regiment. So <clears throat> off they go. And they're fed. They march to the train station in Boston. And there they're loaded on a train and sent to New York. Now, I have another great, great grandfather named Samuel Chapman Graves, who was a lieutenant in not Martin's company. He got as far as New York and shot himself in the foot by accident. <laughs> he sent, he's, he's sent back to Marblehead. Very fortunate, by the way, because he comes back and forms a regiment here that he takes off. And, leads them off, and he's at war from 1862 to 1865. And I'm reading, I'm going, Samuel Chapman Graves is, is injured in New York and has to return to Marblehead. And I'm going, I wonder what happened. Well, not Martin without my great-great-grandfather proceeds to New York by train. They get to New York, and they're received by crowds. They are put up at the Astoria Hotel. In fact, one of them writes, it was incredible setting up the first night in a hotel. They're fed. They're treated like royalty. That's what he said. We are chosen men. They then decide they're going to go to the Jersey City. And this sort of sent shivers up and down my back when I read it. The crossing on a boat to go to Jersey City, as Anderson and those federal troops from Charleston, South Carolina, are coming into New York. So the 8th Regiment is cheering Anderson and the evacuated soldiers from Charleston going to New York and while they're headed to Philadelphia. They march into Philadelphia, and they're treated very well, and they're put up in a hotel in Philadelphia. And it's in Philadelphia that they hear something has happened that's going to change the direction they're going to get to Washington. 
Remember I told you the two regiments? One was the 8th with all these marble headers. And this is the 6th regiment out of Lowell, Lawrence, Tracott, Belrica. They're going to Washington as well. But they head not to Philly. They go through the city of Baltimore. And in that April morning that they're responding, they're being brought by train to Baltimore. Baltimore had an ordinance that said no train may go through the city of Baltimore because of noise and pollution. So in the outskirts of Baltimore, the locomotive is disconnected and horses drag the railroad cars through the city to the other side of the city where they to be hitched up with a locomotive. Three-fourths of that 6th Regiment go through the city. But they see there's a mob forming. It's only when the last railroad cars are being brought through does the mob stop the car, disconnect the horses, and they start with rocks, bricks, pavement, breaking the glass, pounding on the car, almost to the point where they're going to turn it over. Now, three-fourths of the regiment is on the other side of the city. Those soldiers of the 6th Regiment, including the musicians who have their instruments only to protect themselves, are told we are going to march the rest of the distance. They get out of the cars, and they start marching, and the, and the mob fired on them, killing four or five Massachusetts soldiers. The 6th Regiment opens fire on the mob in Baltimore, Maryland. It is a fight and flee scene for both. The Baltimore police cannot control the mob. When the full regiment gets word that they've been attacked, they come back to pick up the rest of the regiment. We, we, we know how many have been killed in the 6th Regiment. We have no idea who has been killed in this Baltimore uh, incident. The 8th Regiment was supposed to go up into Baltimore. They suddenly make the decision, Benjamin Butler, who, by the way, has just split his coat open, and by the way, the only tailor who could sew it is from Company C, from Marblehead, so at least they can claim they patched up General Benjamin Butler. Anybody here descended of Benjamin Butler? Oh, good, then I can keep on talking. <laughs> <coughs> He's not a popular individual in New Orleans. Um, Benjamin Butler decides that they will basically hijack a transport, a ship, and go to Annapolis, Maryland. And so they find this vessel called the Maryland, which is sort of interesting. It's a, a transport that carried coal carts. And those carts are just dirty. They're sitting on the upper deck. He seizes the boat, and he puts most of the regiment on the Maryland. And they travel all night on that vessel to get to Annapolis. What's at Annapolis? The Naval Academy. The Naval Academy had been founded in the 1840s. They come into the Naval Academy about midnight. Benjamin Butler. Captain Martin, Captain Boardman, Captain Phillips from the 3rd Regiment, Company B. And the governor of Maryland protests, claiming that he hasn't been invaded by foreign troops. Benjamin Butler said to him, Sir, these are federal troops in a federal state. Remember, Maryland has not left the Union. The troops now occupy the Naval Academy. They take all the cadets and the instructors and they put them on the transport and send them to New, to basically, I was going to say New York, but they send them to New London, Connecticut. <laughs> Sitting at the Naval Academy is the frigate Constitution. Francis Boardman and Company H Despite the fact what Salem will say, 
is the first company to be on board that vessel. The problem is, she's sitting in the mud. So the Marblehead companies, all three of them, and by the way, no food except pilot crackers, pilot biscuits that have been baked in 1848, 13 years before, <laughs> are being served them. They worked all day to try and pull the Constitution out of the mud. They got her out of the mud. And the steamer they're using to pull her out runs aground. So they sit on board this steamer waiting for the tide to change. What do you do with a floating constitution in Annapolis Harbor that at any point Maryland could do the same thing South Carolina? Well, Benjamin Butler takes a company from Salem and he puts them on board the Constitution and Salem sails it to New York. But we fixed it so they could sail it <laughs> to New York, not being prejudicial or provincial. What does Benjamin Butler do now? Can't go to Baltimore. He's 40 miles from Washington. He's in Annapolis. They're going to march the 40 miles. But he figures, we'll go to the train station and get a train that will take us to Washington, DC. The only problem, when they get there, the citizens of Maryland have torn up the tracks, locked the roundhouse, and taken the locomotive there apart. Well, ne never let it be said that they didn't take some time and think about what they were going to do. While they're sitting there, Martin demands that the roundhouse be opened. In fact, he threatens the depot master, and the roundhouse is open. There is a private from Beverly, Massachusetts, Company E. His name is Charles Holman. Charles Holman looked at the locomotive and said, two years ago, I built that locomotive. With some help and two hours of work, they reassembled the locomotive. And they're going to start the locomotive up and go to Washington. But there's one problem. There are no tracks. So Company C, Company B, and Company H proceed along laying track. They go into the woods, they find the track. Uh, there's even a, a picture out of Leslie's Weekly of somebody from one of these, each of the Company C, Company B, Company H, they come to a bridge with a river underneath. Two soldiers strip down, dive into the water, find the, the rails, tie the ropes to it, pull the rails up, and they lay the... They're going through and laying track. Now, this is not an easy task, because all the while, you have to keep your men on 10 miles on one side and 10 miles on the other to prevent snipers from attacking. It's slow work. And who shows up? In Annapolis, the 6th Massachusetts Regiment that hasn't been able to get to Washington, D.C., and they hear there's only one way in, they have come down from Baltimore to Annapolis. And the New York 7th Regiment, Irish Civil War soldiers, show up. Butler says, we will continue building the track. 6th regiment has been attacked, they should be the first ones into Washington. Remember, outside the few federal troops in Washington, that's it that's protecting Lincoln. So the 7th out of New York, the 6th from Massachusetts proceed into Washington. They are the first ones to get to Washington. The third set that gets in, you know it, the 8th regiment. Where are they housed? 
hotel? Willard Hotel would be nice. It's a beautiful <laughs> hotel. They're housed in the U.S. Capitol. It isn't finished yet. The dome is open. Company C, Company B, and Company H set their tents up in the rotunda, build their fires in the marble floors. Now, while they're there, they sit at the congressman's desk. And I read to you a letter back to Marblehead to another relative of mine on congressional stationery that he seized. <laughs> and wait till you hear the last name, and then you will really appreciate the Marblehead connection. Washington City, dear friend Roundy, I now sit down to write you a few lines to let you know that all hands are well and hope this will find you the same. We are all at the Capitol, a place which we are all bound to defend till the last. There is about 15,000 here now, and they keep a pouring in all the time. I think if Jeff Davis undertakes to take this capital, he will get his share of lead. We've had a hard time to get here to Washington as the tracks were all ripped up from Annapolis to the junction, about 20 miles away. By the way, that's where Company C, Company B, and Company H will be assigned. They're assigned to protect that junction, to keep it open for all the federal troops coming in. And guess where they're assigned next? Baltimore, Maryland. And Butler goes in, and Baltimore, Maryland does not like Benjamin Butler. OK. Um, but with a determination, we pushed on to Washington. We expected to have a fight at the junction, as they said there were 1,500 men there from Baltimore to meet us. But when we got there, they were not to be found. If they had been, they would have been revenged for the blood in Baltimore. But they heard that we were pre prepared for them, and like all cowards, they were afraid to meet us face to face. Give my best regards to all the boys and tell them to buckle on their armor and fight for their country. I want you to write to me, your friend, William T. Blackler. <laughs> now, this is a sample of what the letters were like that came back. They were not talking about slavery, sectionalism, territorial expansion. For the average soldier, they were talking about country. They were talking about government. I'm not sure they truly understood all of the complex reasons. But for them, this was their fight. Well, after uh, being at Baltimore, uh, they are discharged in August 1861, and they return to Marblehead. Marblehead greets them. And by the way, they come back in on the train. They march to the townhouse. There they're welcomed. It was bad weather again. So the next day they assembled and they're taken to Fort Sewell for a fish chowder banquet at Fort Sewell. And then they are discharged. Not Martin goes on and forms uh, his own company, part of the 23rd U.S. Army Regiment. My great-great-grandfather picks up for Not Martin and takes command of Company C, again under Benjamin Butler, and is sent to newborn North Carolina, where Benjamin Butler is not cared for, and serves at newborn and is involved in skirmishes in Newport. And then he comes back in 1865, forms up Company C again, they one year service. They're signed back into that area, served one year, came back in January 1865, and he forms up the 27th unattached company, all of marble headers. And they're assigned to guard Fort Warren in Boston Harbor and Fort Miles Standish uh, down in Plymouth. And he ends up June 1865, uh, at the end of the Civil War. Not Martin continues on, gets involved in politics in the town of Marblehead. In fact, I think he even ends up being the postmaster. 
it's interesting, if you look at the people that were in that regiment, there's a drummer boy in Company C under Knott Martin. His name is Sam Rhodes, Jr. He ends up writing History and Traditions of the Town of Marblehead. There's a sergeant, Benjamin F. Peach, Jr. He's a sergeant. He ends the war in 1865 as a brigadier general, the highest ranking Marblehead for that war. We can look at the town of Marblehead and say, what do they look like? Well, when they went out, they must have been snazzy looking. Blue coats with yellow buttons, white waistcoats, white pantaloons, issue 1840, um, black cravat around the neck, round black hat with a cockade with gold trim, cartridge box with 24 cartridges, so I know they're muskets. Um, white belt around the body and an apsack. Scorp corporals dressed the same way. Sergeants, the only way you knew a sergeant was the first sergeant wore a lace knot around his right shoulder. All other sergeants wore it on the left. And the commissioned officers wore the same except they had epaulets. And by the time that 8th Regiment got to Washington in 1861, and they're at the, the federal capital. Their uniforms had worn out. The muskets were no good. They were then brought into federal service, given federal uniforms, and issued the standard military issue, Mexican War style. And that's what they would have had. Their hats would have been replaced by what they call a forage hat. This is what. Uh, Privates war. This is what enlisted men and commission officers wore. The only way you knew it was the distinction here. Now, it's sort of fun because in doing the research, I said, you know, you know, I wonder what Samuel Chapman Graves looked like. This is a great great grandfather. I was a kid. I remember an oil painting hanging at my aunt Luna's house. No, you don't want to ask. Aunt Luna, who married somebody named Lewis. That was incredible. But I, I knew her. And she had met Lincoln. And I always thought that was neat. But I said, what did Samuel Chapman? So this is what he looked like in Rhodes's history. But a good friend of mine, for something I had done for him, three days ago said, Don, I'm giving you six months on Ancestry.com, and there's a section on that that I went to, not last night, but the night before. In fact, I was yelling and shouting because it says military, so I went down, pulled up, typed in Samuel Chapman Graves, and that shows up. The only picture that I know of Samuel Chapman Graves in full military uniform. None of my family had this, but Ancestry.com had it. <laughs> And so I was all excited because now I get to see what a captain in the 8th Regiment dressed like. Linda, by the way, looked at it and said, Don, let's see. I said, no. <laughs> but it was fun to do this. And for the next five years, we're going to be celebrating the Civil War. And if you have Civil War uh, ancestors, you may be doing just what I did, and you may be whooping and yelling, just like the Baltimore mob, if you find something. And by the way, it's easy to find it. There's plenty of information out there. But I just want to tell you, the war itself had incredible sacrifices. Out of a small town, they provided 1,048 men. 827 in the army. 221 in the Navy, one in the Marines. At the end of the war, 110 Marbleheaders never returned to this town alive. They came back, but they're buried at Waterside Cemetery. Where did they die? Andersonville. And if you looked at it, they're captured. And usually, I hate to tell you, they're not infantry. They're artillery that have been overrun and captured, 
and held in southern prisons. What did they die from? Some died from wounds, most died from disease. It is a documented war. You will see pictures of this for the next five years. It is a mechanical war. There's horrible stories told of families that had sons involved in the war. They went up to church, came back, and sitting on the front porch is a coffin. They were efficient. At the end of the war, over one million soldiers are under arms in 1865. What do you do with them? With some of them, you sent west. Most of those were black soldiers who didn't have jobs to go to. Some were sent down to Texas because we feared there would be an invasion from Mexico from a French prince named Maximilian. The rest were discharged and the paperwork had to be done because they knew at some point there might be pensions that had to be handled. The town of Marblehead, two days after those soldiers marched out, held a town meeting on a Saturday. The proposal was to come up with $500 to support the families of those soldiers that marched out. By the time the town meeting ended, they had appropriated $5,000. At the end of the war, the town of Marblehead had raised almost $108,000 to support the families that remained in the town of Marblehead and raised $140,000 to support the troops on the field. Ladies and gentlemen, the Civil War had an incredible impact on this town. You know why? It was economically the best times. They wanted shoes. We could provide the shoes. But when the war was over, those veterans returning came back and there weren't jobs for them. And the recession hit. Many of those soldiers I've traced, they went to Lynn to work at the shoe factories because this town was hit with a heavy depression. And we saw it in 1873. By that time, it hit worldwide. The South was in destruction. Neat little story. I had to be 18 years of age to sign up. And so 16-year-old, and the youngest, by the way, was nine years of age. He had to be 18. So what the 16 and 17-year-olds did is they took a piece of paper and wrote 18 on it, took their shoe off and put it in their shoe so they could turn to the recruiter and swear that they were over 18 <laughs> to sign up. Ladies, there were females who signed up as males and served throughout the Civil War without being detected. And in one case in Massachusetts where in 1911 she was in a car accident and they suddenly discovered she was a woman. She'd been living under the man's name for the entire time. The Civil War is a fun episode to research, but we always have to remember the human sacrifices that took place. What caused it? It, it started at the time of the American Revolution. Slaves weren't freed. Emancipation Proclamation freed every slave in Southern territory, not in Northern territory. It wasn't until the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And we know because we lived through the Second American Civil War, 1950s, 1960s. When the issue of slavery was solved, the issue of racism was never addressed. And it would take 100 years for our country to catch up with it. That is part of the legacy of the Civil War. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I didn't see you tap your watch. Sure. Questions? But I'm a southerner. Welcome. <laughs> and I've lived in Massachusetts longer than I lived in the south. However, I'd like to tell a little tiny bit about my ancestry 
Okay. Sure. I will keep my hat here. <laughs> my grandfather um, signed on in Virginia the day that um, Virginia seceded from the nation. I think it was April 12th or 14th. That's right, right at the time of Fort Sumner. He signed up. He went through the war. Um, many battles. He um, went through to Gettysburg, lived through it, and was with Lee when he surrendered at Appomattox. And um, so I, I guess I'm fortunate that I'm here, <laughs> that he lived through it. He was my mother's father. Um, anyway, um, but you, it's being a Virginian and born there, and I left when I was only eight, but I'm still a Virginian. Um, the, the war is certainly still a memorable down there, probably more so than it is up here. I, I drive the back roads of Virginia, and there are signs everywhere. This battle, that battle. I swear half the, half the Civil War was fought in Virginia. And A good part of it was. It was. It was. Anyway, but um, it was a whole different thing. And it was, their, their idea was not slavery. It was just that their, their way of life was being um, threatened. Threatened, yes. Anyway, but um, I just wanted to tell you that. What's and uh, Thank you. we still feel it, feel it down there a lot. A lot. Mm -hmm. So it will be, and um, I just came back. I spent the winter down there. Uh, my daughter lives there. And, uh, and there was a big thing in the paper all about the Civil War, and it's not a thing to celebrate, but to re recognize. And, uh, you know, anyway. thank you. One, one of the hard parts is that, remember I told you Union soldiers, accurate records because of pensions? Well, Confederate soldiers, after the surrenders, are simply turned and sent home. There is no pension for those Confederate soldiers. And anyone colonel and above are disenfranchised. Their American citizen, citizenship was removed mm -hmm. because of that war. Uh, so. There were some tough feelings at that period of time. And I, I love the story of the poor farmer in Manassas, Virginia, who had his farm overrun with the first battle of Bull Run, Union name, Manassas Junction, the southern name. So he moved to the little quiet village of Gettysburg <laughs> and bought a farm there. And in 1863, his farm is overrun by Union troops. He moved and went south to a quiet hamlet, Appomattox Courthouse, where he bought a farm. He was there for the beginning of the war, and by story, he's there for the end of the war. Uh, and it, it's interesting because we always have to remember there are Confederate losses and sacrifices that took place. And after that war, those wounds had to be bound up, and it would take a long time to do that. Uh, given the numbers you cited of um, about 10% of Marblehead people that uh, fought in the war died, uh, but you said between 1,000 and 1,100 total? Yes. At that time, do you have a sense of what percentage of the population that represented? Someone had told me, the po and, and I, I'm going to guess because I can't accurately uh, tell you, I think the population is about 5,000. One out of five is involved in that war. What, what is it? 7,800. Okay, then I stand corrected. So it's, so it's not as high as 20%. Uh, but even then, that's a massive impact for uh, a small community. Uh, any other questions? I encourage you, if you do have Civil War ancestors, find out. It's fascinating uh, to what see. Is that again? 
Well, you have to pay uh, to go on. It's Ancestry.com. But there are volumes here. There's volumes in the library if they're Massachusetts soldiers. And you can very easily go down and pick that up and find a background. And then I'd encourage you to explore here to see if there's any information. In the 1920s, they were actually having many of them write down their experiences. Good.